People with developmental disabilities have been making great strides towards integration in the workforce and into society in general. But many are upset about the language that's used to describe them. Most people with developmental disabilities would like to see the term mentally retarded and its contractions, retarded and retard, disappear into history. But it's a tough battle because some members of the media in particular insist on using the word. On today's show, we'll hear both sides of the argument. You're watching DNet, the Disability Network. I'm Joe Coughlin. And I'm Susan Pettit. Also in this week's show, we'll meet a disabled artist who specializes in medical illustration. And we'll see how payphones can be adapted for people who are deaf. But first, here's this week's roundup of disability news. Deaf or hard of hearing customers of Rogers Cable Systems will soon be able to get closed caption decoders for free. At a news conference in Ottawa, Rogers launched a $2 million program called TVC. By next spring, Rogers hopes the service will be available to 1.5 million customers in Ontario, Alberta and British Columbia. People who are autistic are being offered a device to help them communicate, but some experts are skeptical about its effectiveness. For that story, we go to Calgary and CBC reporter LaVon Butcher. I, I told you this for years. For most five-year-olds, the world is curious and exciting, a place they're just beginning to discover. But it can also be a scary place, when like Robert McNeil, you can't communicate with the people in it. Robert is autistic. He watches the world with a wary eye, with only momentary signs he's part of it. We feel that Robert understands us, and he responds to us, he'll obey direction, but uh, he just won't say hi. Or carry on a conversation like any other six-year-old child. You know, Robert, how was your day at school when he comes in the door? I'd love him to tell me, you know, whether it was good or bad or what he did. It's not difficult to see when Robert is happy or sad, but it's always tough trying to figure out what's going on inside his head. It's the toughest part, not being able to get through. It's like that movie Rain Man when the guy said, I know you're in there. E. This small e gadget is helping autistic e people come out. It's a communicator, and what this autistic girl is doing is called facilitated communication, a big name for a simple technique. By teaching them how to use the communicator, or even just a board with the alphabet on it, some autistic kids are learning to relate their thoughts. Yes. Is there anything else you want to say at this time? Fine. E. S. Okay. It's a new form of treatment and a controversial one. It's being greeted warily by some who work with the autistic, primarily because it often only works if someone touches their hand, raising questions about whether the words are really their own. Even this American professor who brought the method to North America agrees people need to see the results on their own. I think it's natural that there would be a lot of skepticism about this method. I think, you know, in this sense, seeing is believing. The believers call it miraculous, and it's changing the way a lot of people view autism, which is a mysterious brain disorder that keeps people locked away in their own world, unable to communicate. The McNeils say they now have real hope that Robert will eventually be able to not only show them how he feels, but also tell them in his own words. For the CBC Alberta News, I'm LaVon Butcher. The Manitoba Human Rights Commission is launching a two-year project to help people with disabilities find jobs and housing. The Commission says traditional affirmative action programs have failed, and that is why a different approach is needed. Chairman Ken Philco says the Commission will adopt a higher profile in pushing for better housing and job opportunities for people with disabilities. The Commission will also make its services more accessible to people who are deaf or hard of hearing. A disabled man in Sydney, Australia has come up with a unique way of getting around town. John Ahern, a paraplegic, travels to work and around Sydney on a mobile bed. Ahern became a paraplegic 13 years ago after a viral spine infection and later developed osteoarthritis of the spine, which made it impossible for him to sit up. He continued to work at the Sydney Home Care Service, but found paying about 80 US dollars a week for taxis too expensive, even with a government subsidy. So he converted a motorbike into a motorized bed and now drives to work lying down. He says he will not wear a safety belt because if I go over a cliff, I want to be thrown clear. 
The bed costs him only about three US dollars a week for gas and has a range of about 150 kilometers or 90 miles. Once at the office, Ahern works lying on his stomach on a special bed. He says he needs the income, but more importantly, the work gives him a sense of belonging to the community despite his disability. And that's this week's roundup of disability news. Next on DNet, has the term mentally retarded worn out its welcome? Joining us now is Shafali Sajani. Shafali is going to look at the controversy surrounding the use of the word retarded. Shafali? Thanks, Joe. As you know, many people with developmental disabilities object strongly to being called mentally retarded. They feel the term and its contractions, retarded or retard, set them apart from society in general, and they want to be recognized as people. Back in 1981, a group of people with developmental disabilities formed their own consumer group. It's called People First. Their first victory was persuading the Canadian Association for the Mentally Retarded to change its name. That's an association of parents and advocates. It's now called the Canadian Association for Community Living. And most provincial and local groups have followed its lead, but not all of them. Another group that's reluctant to drop the term mentally retarded is the media. The Globe and Mail style guide, for instance, outlines that paper's position on which words should and should not be used when covering disability issues. And they've chosen to continue using the term mentally retarded. Earlier, I spoke with three people about the phrase. Sean Fine is social policy reporter for the Globe and Mail. Diane Richler is the executive vice president of the Canadian Association for Community Living. And Pat Wirth is the president of People First of Canada. Mr. Wirth, why does the word retarded offend you? It's offensive to me and to the members of People First because what that label has meant is long-term institutionalization, people being segregated against their will, people not having any choices or, or rights in their life, and they've had to constantly fight for social status in their lives where other rights have been given to people, no rights have been given to them. Have you ever been called retarded to your face? Yes. How did it make you feel? It made me feel that people don't respect me as a human being. Mr. Fine, why do you, you use the word retarded? Well, the term that I've used is mentally retarded, and I've used it because um, while recognizing uh, that, it, that it does cause people like Pat some pain, it seems to be the only word that we have right now that is clear, descriptive, and specific. Um, I don't think there would be any point in us being wedded to the term mindlessly, but at the same time, we don't have an alternative that is widely understood. I think some of the terms that have been coined uh, simply are not understood by a broad enough uh, section of the population. Would you be comfortable calling Mr. Worth retarded to his face? Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. No, I, I don't consider individuals by their label. Um, or by a label, and whether that label is even appropriate in this instance, I have no idea. But, um, and in fact, in the Globe Style Guide, it cautions us against using the term in the case of individuals. Uh, what we do is apply it to a group because uh, there are policies and practices applied to that group and, and, and uh, issues surrounding this group. And in those cases, we, we use the word so that people understand who it is that we're talking about. Mrs. Richler, what's your response to this position of the media that the term retarded is, t is un more widely understood than some of the terms that you might prefer? The Globe and Mail style book also uh, refers to the fact that groups should not be called by terms that are hurtful and uh, offensive. And in fact, if individuals who have been called retarded object to the term, then 
we believe that it's very important not to call people a name that hurts them, regardless of what other people understand by that term. And that's no different from what's happened uh, to the women's movement or to the black um, movement, Afro-American movement, when groups have, it's been very important for groups to come up with their own name of what they feel, com how they feel comfortable being identified. Mr. Fine, has anything you've heard changed your mind? I've heard some interesting points and I, I accept a lot of them, but at the same time, we're in a difficult position in that we need a label not for individuals, but for groups. Uh, and while those labels may be limited and, uh, as Diane suggests, uh, fairly arbitrary, at the same time, they do orient the public to, to know who it is that we're talking about. And, and uh, Diane has a group that serves people with this label. So, uh, I mean, there is sort of an identifiable group which does cover, of course, a range of abilities and, and everything else. And we have to have a way to point our readers to this group. And as I said before, there, if we had an alternative that, that people could understand, I don't think there'd be any problem with, with moving on to that. Mr. Worth, has anything that Mr. Fine said affected your position in terms of uh, the general public understanding more about the people that your group represents? I feel that the media has a responsibility to educate the public through the people who have been oppressed by a label. They, have, they should have a responsibility to educate the public about how a label has affected people and what it's done to their human lives. I don't think that the appropriate way is to go about publicizing them in the media as being mentally retarded or mentally handicapped or any other label. Pat Worth, Diane Richler, Sean Fine, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Word Choices is published by the Ontario Office for Disability Issues. It recommends that mentally retarded should be replaced by people with developmental disabilities. The terms in the guide are based on consumer input. Edward Hudak, who writes for the Detroit Free Press, had this to say about language. Those who use words to earn a living know they can be as powerful as a loaded handgun. Words blindly fired in anger or out of ignorance can maim or destroy the human spirit. We'd like to know what you think. Are words just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to stereotyping people? Or is all this emphasis on language making a mountain out of a molehill? Give us a call at the DNet Opinion Line. We'll give you the number at the end of the program. Last week, we reported on Nancy B's case in Quebec City. She's paralyzed and dependent on a respirator to breathe. Many people in the disabled community are concerned that she may not be aware of all the choices that are out there. We asked you to let us know if you think it should be easier for people with disabilities to find out about all their options. We'd like to thank everyone who called. Here are some of your reactions. Carla Flagel called from British Columbia. She is a home care respiratory therapist, and she takes care of 45 people who use respirators. I can attest to the fact that people who are not warehoused in long-term care facilities are more motivated, contributing members to society. It's essential that people with disabilities, like those without, be given choices. But because of a lack of understanding by the medical community, society, and government agencies, many people are never given the choice, and I applaud the efforts of those that are making it possible for people to have choices. Jim Lauber lives in Whitby, Ontario. He's been taking care of a disabled family member for over 20 years. We've been fighting the system for years, trying to get information, and that it seems to be a big, almost a conspiracy of silence about it all. Colleen Waters of Winnipeg, Manitoba, agrees that people should have more choices, especially access to information and referral services. And she believes a good source is independent living centers. I think the professionals, the social workers, the nurses, therapists, uh, physicians, uh, anybody else that uh, a person is dealing with when they first become disabled or in, in the hospital, etc., or are working through a social agency should have access to the information that's available through an independent living center so that they can pass this on to consumers. Robert Dixon of North Vancouver thinks people should be able to determine their own destiny. I think that people should be allowed to take their lives when they want to. It's theirs, and I don't think government interference should be allowed. Once again, we'd like to thank everyone who called in from across the country and from the United States. Coming up next, more proof that disability is not a barrier to an interesting career.
On the July 1st weekend in 1987, Mark Goslin lost the use of his legs as the result of a car accident, but that didn't stop him from pursuing his interest in medicine. He just combined it with his skill and talent as an artist. He's now taking a course in medical illustration at the University of Toronto. About four years ago uh, in my hometown, Kingston, I had a car accident. I was enrolled in applied science at Queen's University and uh, my intention was to go into the medical field, uh, become a surgeon maybe. I never really thought of uh, doing art as a career, but it just seemed to be the best thing uh, after my accident. In our family we all have uh, artistic inclinations. I, I enjoy drawing wildlife on my spare time. What are, you, what are you doing with yours? Oh, this is this I'm working on the wolf here. A little bit of dental anatomy. This program is just a wonderful mixture of academics and illustration. We, we're going to class with the medical students, taking things like gross anatomy. You're learning about the, what you're going to be drawing. Everyone I work with is so talented that uh, we each we all learn from each other. It's, it's just a pleasure to be around them all day, do everything together, and to see their work pro progressively through the, the day. I don't want people to, to base their decisions on the fact that I'm in a wheelchair or not. And, and I think the way I put myself across to people, I don't think they see the, the chair anymore. I know it hasn't been a long time that I've been in a chair, but uh, I've become rather agile with the chair. I, I can do most anything with them unless I'm confronted with a step. In my profession, uh, we're always called to be sitting behind a desk, and it gets very static, you know, when you're doing this every day, day after day. So I always enjoy just uh, if I've got to go somewhere, I, I'm always wheeling there. I don't have any modes of transportation other than just pushing myself to my destination. And that, that kind of keeps my mind clear. I don't think I would have been able to make it without my family. I have a very close family, and uh, they basically were there for me, and they pulled me through. Um, uh, my friends, my friends at the time were while I was in the hospital were always there. Just the way they were before the accident, like if had nothing had ever happened. And uh, so that kind of gave me that type of attitude right off the bat that uh, I'm not different. Uh, it doesn't matter that I'm in a chair. And uh, some people even kind of forget to ask me, you know, what happened? Because it, it kind of becomes invisible the way I, I kind of react with people. And I'm, I'm glad about that. Joe, you know, the great thing about Gosselin's medical illustration course is that he can develop a portfolio of clients as he works on his assignments. Next on DNet, a payphone with a difference. Most of us take payphones for granted, but a large segment of the population, people who are deaf, don't have access to regular phone booths. They can contact each other at home by typing out messages on keyboards attached to TTYs or TDDs. Henry Whalen, the host of News World's program Silent News, and interpreter Michael Vorontsov showed me how the same type of system can be used with payphones. They took me to George Brown College in Toronto, where one of these devices is currently in use. You imagine Toronto being a large city and you've got 2.5 million people. We only have two of these in the city of Toronto. And we have about 22,000 deaf people who would access this phone. So one is here at George Brown College and one is at the Sky Dome. So we only have two and they're not terribly accessible, obviously. Why aren't there more of these phones installed in Toronto? 
Well, Bell Canada um, looks upon this as a pilot program and um, they're evaluating the process. And Bell says it doesn't make a lot of money with this kind of telephone. So um, they obviously are not thinking about accessibility or any of those kinds of issues. Can people with hearing use this phone? Um, you see, it's, it's a re regular receiver, just like the other telephones. Um, it's got the um, amplified sound for hard of hearing users, um, so anybody can use this telephone. Um, when deaf people use this telephone, they hang it on the second um, handset and um, type away on the TTY, because the only, uh, the only function that, need, that they need is the actual TTY itself. Can you demonstrate how this phone works for me? How does the phone work? It's just like a, a regular phone. I got to put a quarter in, right? So they pick up the phone. Hearing people pick up the phone, I don't do that. What I do is I put it on the second hand rest, if you will. I deposit my quarter, and then I dial in my number. Now, we hope that whoever is on the other line will answer, and we see the light flashing. This tells us that the number is now being dialed, the frequency of the flash. And now, again, to the frequency of the flash, it tells us that the phone is ringing. So it's a delay, the red light comes on, and then they've answered, so now the phone's out and there is a, a readout on the screen. Hello, this is um, Michelle here, go ahead. And now I type my message. When, in effect, this phone hears the other TTY, it hears the signal, then that activates the drawer. The drawer then comes out because it's heard the signal, in effect, all right? and then. And then I see their message on the, on the screen, so then I, I, I respond to their message. And then I go ahead with my conversation. And now it's just like a regular conversation. A hearing person talks, and I'm talking as well. So it's a regular conversation. So now, <laughs> see, it, and it closes, you see. <laughs> Not when we expect it, but it does close. <laughs> You see, there was no use. What was happening is that we were having a conversation. There was no use on the TTY. So as an act in terms of, uh, um, you know, so that there is no damage, what happens is it protects itself and then it closes. We um, um, encourage deaf organizations, um, uh, hearing friends, um, advocates, to all work together to um, push for, to um, advocate for more phones. Um, we do a writing series, writing into Bell Canada. Um, and then we also um, talk to the Bell Relay Committee and also pressure them to install more of these telephones as well. We need a lot of support from um, um, our member organizations and community and the community in general to um, push um, for these services. Here's another useful device for people who are deaf. It's a vibrating pager that works in conjunction with a TDD. You just dial the number of the pager terminal and then type the message using a regular TDD. You can transmit up to 80 characters. And that's our show. I'm Susan Pettit. And I'm Joe Coglin. See you again next week. And here's the phone number for the DNet Opinion Line. Call 416-921-7933. That's 416-921-7933. Or if you'd rather write to us, our address is the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. That's Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. Our fax number is area code 416 975-5636.